Welcome, friends, to the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm filmmaker James Bailey. And I'm writer Luke Elliott. And this week, we are taking a break. We are going to release a previous Patreon-exclusive episode. It's a From the Vault episode, and it's covering Sandman Season 1, but just the episode that was released afterwards, Episode 11, which yeah. kind of had a cool release uh, schedule to it. Yeah, it was like a it was like a little bonus thing they put out after the main season was done, and it covered some of the stuff that we didn't we weren't sure if we were gonna get um, from the comics, and that was like a you know very cat based episode and the Calliope episode, uh, and and so it was a cool little cool little thing they released, and we did this bonus episode around the time it came out. Um, I think I think at the end of this we also are reacting to the first episode of House of the Dragon. Um, I, you know, I don't really remember what we said, but I know we were excited about it. And I think we talk about it at the end some there. So if you want to hear these things like as they're coming out, that's where you're going to want to be on Patreon uh, and you can get these like as soon as we drop them. Yeah, because we are excited now having it confirmed. We're getting a season two of the Sandman, which I don't know that we had confirmed at the I time. I think we theorize about it in here. And House of the Dragon season two is definitely coming very soon as well. So we're, right. we're very excited about it. And then like, you know, we may at some point possibly cover House of the Dragon as like a full project in the main feed. But this is kind of our first initial reactions to a, what I would say is a positive look at more A Song of Ice and Fire after, you know, the end of the final season left us kind of uh, frustrated. Yeah, yeah. I think we were, we were excited. I think we were cautiously optimistic. Um, and then I remember, yeah, I remember enjoying the rest of that season. But yeah, enjoy this. We will be back uh, in the following week with our Casino Royale film episode. So you can look forward to that. But until then, uh, enjoy this previous Patreon exclusive. This week, we will be talking about the surprise bonus episode that The Sandman put out, uh, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. Great surprise to us because it came out the day that we released our episode, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, I was excited that, that we had more Sandman. Yeah, and it, it kind of invalidated a couple things we said on that episode where we were talking about these like weird issues at the end that uh, weren't in the show, and, and that was one of the things we really liked about, even though like we had mixed feelings about them, it was still cool to see these like bizarre uh cat dream thing and like all this stuff and then now all of a sudden it's in the actual show it kind of changes things a little bit so yeah definitely excited to talk about it um it is it's it came out as one episode episode 11 but it's like a two-parter the dream of a thousand cats is fairly short i think it was only about like 16 17 minutes yeah. and then the uh calliope episode is a is almost a full length like 45 40 48 something like that minute uh episode so um it felt more like a, a complete episode of Sandman, whereas the Cats one is just this kind of fun little mini short thing, and it's animated, and yeah, I don't. We're, we're, let's focus on the Cat one first. Yeah. I think. I uh, think that my enthusiasm for the Cat one showed up in our episode. Like, I really just <laughs> thought it was fun, a fun yeah, bit of storytelling. Still keeps in line with a lot of the things that I love about Sandman, and just it's showing that like these really clever, unique kind of storytelling things that Neil Gaiman wants to do, he can achieve in this medium of of the Sandman in the comic, and then getting to see it adapted, and with that very unique looking animation style. That's I don't even know how to describe that. I'm not really sure. What it's that's like called. A, it reminded me of Arcane a little bit. It's this like it looks like it's been hand drawn, but but blended in a in a way with that CGI 3D element. Um, I'm not I'm not sure how it's done, but I think it was like clearly CG created. Yeah, like in a in a some whatever three dimensional world. And then there were there was an attempt to make it look like frames were taken out so that it was a little more jumpy like an mm -hmm. animator would do. Oh, like um, uh, Into the Spider-Verse kind of looks like that. Something like yeah. that. Like they wanted to give that feeling that it was hand drawn. Yeah. But then it was so there's also a realism look to it. It kind of reminds me of like almost like rotoscope as well. It might be it might be something like that. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it, it, it looks great and and what a cast, you know. I'll, I'll just reference a few of them here. We have Tom Sturridge obviously uh returning as the Cat of Dreams, but then we have a bunch of people who aren't in the show proper who got to show up. We got Sandra O oh, as the prophet, uh, the, the main cat, we have um, James McAvoy, who plays this golden-haired man. It's almost just like a cameo, just for a second. Quick cameo. We have David Tennant, who was the voice of Dawn, which I'm not sure. Is that the voice of the a cat that comes to pick up the main cat? Um, I think it's, uh, sorry, the tabby kitten, whose name is Rosie Day. is the name of the uh, the actor. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, because the, they just say, like, Dawn. I'm like, I'm not sure which, which cat that is. Yeah, Dawn. Well, the, notably, Dawn and Paul are David Tennant and Michael Sheen. Yeah, Michael Sheen. So, good omens, fame, uh, connection to, to Gaiman. Another Doctor Who 
uh, reference as well in in Gaiman's The Sandman now with David Tennant actually yeah. being a doctor showing up. So that was cool. So cool. And then um, Neil Gaiman himself is the voice of this crow with like a skull. I, did you did you immediately recognize oh, yes. his voice? Oh yeah. yeah. As soon as he started talking, I was so excited. I was like, it's Neil Gaiman. <laughs> I have heard Gaiman narrate some of his own stories before. I think yeah. maybe something we've listened to potentially. Yeah, he did a reading Coraline. of Coraline. Yeah, maybe he did do the audio book for Coraline. I know he did it for um, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, which we haven't covered because it's, you know, it's the only adaptation for that is a stage adaptation, I think. But um, I really like that book, and he, I think he read that one. I can't remember if he also read Coraline or not, but I've definitely listened to that. I know he did a reading of, like, The Raven, I think, around Halloween one year that came out on, like, YouTube, and I watched that. He's just got a great reading voice. He's great, and uh, like, what a performer! Like, he, yeah. he brings a lot to it. And I turned to my girlfriend, and she she was like, "Oh my god, is that him?" And I was like, "Who?" And she's like, "Dream." And I was like, "No, not Dream, but a very notable voice." <laughs> and I was like, "Have you ever heard Gaiman's voice before?" And she was like, "No." And and that's when I revealed. I was like, "That's uh, not, that's Neil Gaiman." Yeah, he does have a just a, a notable voice. Like, it's very unique. Um, I'm jealous of it. I wish I could read like Neil Gaiman. I know. I think part of it's slowing down. I, that's the one thing I gotta remember is that like. Part of what makes his voice so good is he just speaks very slowly. He's also British. And he's, he's British, which, British. like, you know, yeah. that, that just be British. That'll yeah. help a lot. That'll help. <laughs> we also, just another another couple people, David Gassi played the gray cat. Um, Georgia Tennant played uh, a character as well, which I thought yeah, was cool. Yeah, Laura Lynn. Maybe that's, like, maybe that might be one of the, the, the human characters. I'm I think sure. so. I'm not sure, unfortunately, like because we don't like they have they have names in the cast list, but I don't see a lot of them uh, with names. You know, we don't get their names in the episode. Yeah, what I'm and the, to say. it's most of them are pretty quick. Like James McAvoy is like, if you didn't, if I didn't know he was in it, I don't know that. Like I saw Neil Gaiman's tweet, which is how I like we're actually referencing this right now, um, and he was like, look how good this cast is for this episode. And uh, if you didn't know, I think you missed the James McAvoy. It's so yeah. Quick. So there was a adaptation for Aud- audible of the comic and a lot of these actors appear in that audible adaptation playing different roles for the sandman comics so i'm wondering if that was kind of how this happened because it feels like there's a lot of them that made it into this i think james mcavoy is one of them right like i, think I feel he's... like if i if i remember correctly james mcavoy might be dream yeah and then and then you got uh i think michael sheen and david Tennant are both in the uh, in that audible adaptation as well. So, That's so cool. Yeah. And then he got them all. I mean, like it's just voice acting, right? So they probably, maybe they were doing that and you know, maybe they could even use some of it. I don't know. They probably re-recorded it, but like they have, if they did this issue, you could probably use some of the same stuff and just put it in the animated. I don't know, but they did the, storage. I don't believe was in the audible version. So at the very least storage is completely yeah. new. I do uh, think that I'm going to go back and listen to that because I remember people freaking out when it came out about how good, like in terms of like an audio performance, I've heard that 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 Sandman run is like incredible. Yeah, yeah. It'd be really cool to listen to. Definitely. We should we should dip into that sometime and we can touch back in later. Yeah. So I'm going to read the the synopsis of the episode real quick just to give us a jumping off point. The episode is called Dream of a Thousand Cats. Late one night, a Siamese cat holds a gathering of other cats to tell her story about her encounter with Morpheus. A long time ago, she met a tomcat with whom she gave birth to a litter of mixed breed kittens. This displeased her owners who took the kittens and threw them into the river, traumatizing the Siamese cat. In desperation, the cat dreamed of meeting Morpheus in the form of a black cat and begged him for a solution. Morpheus presents her with a parallel universe in which cats were the dominant species over humans until they fought back by dreaming. Turning them into the cats, mankind sees them as they are today. Upon finishing her story, the Siamese cat urges the other cats to perform the same enlightenment to which they will reclaim their status as the rulers of the earth. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's a, it's like a cute, funny story um, with one like pretty harrowing sequence where the kittens are tossed into the river with the brick in, in the bag. And that was just as heartbreaking, you know, honestly, seeing it on screen. I was watching with my wife and it was definitely like I, I, I contemplated warning her about it because she's pretty sensitive, to that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it was it's definitely affecting. And um, but I think by the time it comes back around, like you are just let it kind of left with this feeling of like, yeah, this is kind of a fun idea. And like I, I saw people posting 
uh, pictures of themselves, um, of, of their cats watching the episode and people are responding like, oh, what are you doing? Don't do that. <laughs> someone told me, so my dog stared at the screen the entire time with the cats meowing and everything. Uh-huh. And someone told me that their dog like jumped up and tried to get the cats. Oh, that's uh, funny. Like tried to attack the TV. So that's, I think it's definitely an episode that's primed to, to get everybody's cat, uh, pets all riled up. Yeah. Well, and it, yeah, also, I mean, like we're on our way to a thousand cats, you know, so we got to be careful. Uh, right. We're all going to be we're all going to be snacks. Um, OK, so I mean, I don't have a lot of thoughts other than that. It was fun. It looked good. Um, but I, I do have more thoughts about uh, Calliope episode. So if you're ready, we yeah. can move into that one. Sure. Yeah. OK. So the episode is called Calliope. Struggling author Richard Maddock visits Erasmus Fry, an elderly former writer who has imprisoned a Greek muse named Calliope in his house. Fry transfers ownership of Calliope, the muse, to Maddock, who discovers that by raping her, he receives inspiration. He does this more than once, despite his promises, until it becomes obvious he never intends to let her go. Calliope sends a desperate plea to Morpheus, her former husband, whom she has not seen since the tragic death of their son, Orpheus. Upon receiving her plea and learning of what has happened to her, Morpheus becomes enraged and confronts Maddock. When he refuses to release Calliope, Morpheus punishes Maddox with an uncontrollable stream of ideas. Maddox soon frees Calliope, who asks Morpheus to lift his curse off Maddox. Morpheus lifts the curse of too many ideas, but Maddox finds himself unable to remember Calliope, Morpheus, or any of his ideas. Calliope vows to make sure what happened to her doesn't happen to anyone else. She and Morpheus share a tender goodbye with her expressing hope that sometime in the future she can visit him in his realm and they'll be able to grieve their son properly. Oh man, uh, a lot to react to in this episode. Um, first off, this was an issue in the comic that I felt super conflicted about. On one hand, I loved the metaphor for storytelling and like the lengths that writers will go to um, and creatives will go to. I like seeing an author who is so desperate that he's turned to essentially sell his soul, which he kind of does here um, through the, you know the actions he's willing to take, right? And he dooms himself and, and, uh, you know, the writers are liars and there's so many fun sort of meta textual things talking about what it's like to be a creative and what it's like to be a writer, um, that was, was updated in this version to modern day. I thought a lot of that was super fun, but in the comic, I, you know, we, and, and I think both of us, we didn't react super well to the depiction of the sexual assault. Um, I know that in the comic, the uh, Calliope was basically nude in like every frame she was in almost um, it, it sh- depicted a lot of the sexual assault was like on the page and it ended up just seeming like poor taste to me at at best and at you know at worst like potentially harmful and you know pretty pretty awful honestly and um, I was a little concerned when I saw that they were making it I'm like how is this gonna come off in live action when you got real people because in some ways it can be a lot worse when you do that right and you got actual human beings um and uh, i was really pleased personally with how it was depicted i felt like they did a good job of reining in some of the more uh unforgivable (laughs) elements of the comic and instead replace it with um at least a more like careful and and uh, nuanced approach um, while, while still maintaining the story, right? Like in the, the kind of the metaphor that's happening here. Realistically, the awful events are kind of the same. It's just yeah. we're getting less of it and it's not seemingly more. It's not shown to be titillating. Exploitive. And yeah. 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 And we the, sh- the focus is a lot more on Calliope, in my opinion, than in the comic. In the comic, it felt like it was a lot more on Richard Maddock. Um, whereas we get a lot of him too, but we, we, we got a lot of sense of Calliope as a person. Uh, she asserts her personhood more, I think in the show saying how she's not a thing and how she was born. And, um, some of that I think is in the comic, but it felt like there was more of an emphasis on it. Um, and that gave her a little more, um, agency within the story. And she even tries to escape on her own. She's, you know, more active in the pursuit of Morpheus and trying to get him to help, um, all of that, I think, did a lot for this story. Even their relationship, too, was built up a lot more, I felt. Like, we, we got it, like, it did happen kind of the same way in the comic, but we got more of the conversation between them and, like, what has gone on in the history that they share. Well, they reveal some new details we did not know in the comics, yeah. That's true. This Doctor Who stuff is everywhere right now. Okay. And the person who plays Maddox 
uh, his name is Arthur Darvel, played he Rory really in Doctor Who. Okay. Who was a companion alongside Amelia Pond, who is Karen Gillian. They are companions alongside Matt Smith as the 11th Doctor. And Matt Smith, we might talk about a little bit here at the House end, of the Dragon. is in House of the Dragon. So there's a lot of a lot of these actors are floating. And then we had David Tennant in this one before. So I love to see it. You know, Doctor Who's a very campy show that's that's like existed for a really long time. It's had good seasons and bad seasons and great episodes and bad episodes. But it's fun to be a fan of it. And I, I do think that there's something if you're into the, like sci-fi stories and that kind of thing. Um, it's so much fun to see these actors who mean a lot to those stories to to continue on and, and play these roles. And a very different character here for for Arthur Darvel. He's like lovable as Rory. And here he's like unforgivable. Like we've, we've talked about some of the things that he, he does as this um, Matic character. Yeah. Um, you, you actually sent me, speaking of Doctor Who, you sent me a TikTok recently where it was like a clip from one of the episodes. Because I'm not a Doctor Who guy. I've only seen like maybe two episodes ever. Uh, it's the episode where Van Gogh is brought to like this exhibit. So if you're a Doctor Who fan, you probably know this episode because apparently it's famous. And he's shown his exhibit in the museum. And it was like pretty moving. And it was cool to see depicted. And I was thinking like, okay, if if this is Doctor Who, then I can, you know, this is something I could be into. So I, I'm still thinking like I probably could enjoy it if I just found a way into it that, I don't know, I, I have yet to find. It's definitely a great episode, and like the the tragedy of it is like Van Gogh died before his influence was ever felt, and so to, like the the, and the idea of I was thinking about a lot of the authors we've covered like that. Yeah, so yeah, and so you know, Doctor is a time traveler, so right. to be able to bring an artist like that to show his influence, and there's a person like a curator in in the museum who's like, I think he's nothing but the greatest artist of all time. And, and it was just, it's a great episode. And uh, I figured you'd appreciate that. Yeah, it was cool. So yeah, if you don't know that episode, maybe look up that clip of the Van Gogh episode of Doctor Who. But anyway, bringing it back to the episode we're talking about, um, I, I thought this was all handled a lot better. And sure enough, I read I read this article uh, today where it was um, Neil Gaiman talking about how that was one of his goals in bringing this to the screen. Um, they brought in sensitivity uh, consultants. They, um, him and uh, the show run- the showrunner whose name is escaping me, um, they, that was something they both wanted to do was to find a way to portray this that like kept the heart alive but was um, up to date with modern sensibilities and made sure that the emphasis was where it should be um, so a lot of the emphasis shifting to Calliope and making it about her and her journey was all deliberate and all done in an effort to to sort of modernize this story that didn't age very well otherwise. And impressively so, because I, I if you had told me that they were going to adapt this, I would have been like, just probably stay away from it because <laughs> yeah. it would be really difficult from what I saw on the page to make it you know, satisfying and, and like a story worth telling. Yeah. Um, the uh, showrunner is Alan Heinberg. Alan Heinberg. I, I I said I was gonna say Alan, but I couldn't pull the last name. Yeah. Have, yeah. We're on a first name basis. With We're on a first Alan name Heinberg. with Alan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I thought that was great, man. What, what what were your thoughts on this one? I definitely felt that all the things that they updated helped it. Um, I was telling my girlfriend as the episode was going on, like, oh, this is much better than I expected. <laughs> like, I kind of was saying, like, I thought this was gonna get really rough. It ended up being satisfying, and it towed the line of it being clearly despicable, but not a, like, you they know, didn't something show they, it. Right. Like the only thing they really showed was him being scratched at the end. Calliope isn't nude at all the entire episode. But like you said, they, it also did a good job of making the story about Calliope and like being someone who and I felt like even in the comic, it was much more of Dream just showing up and saving the day. And Calliope, kind it kind of still goes that way. But Calliope has some agency in terms of like the way things are handled and saying like, you know, make it stop at some point and forgive him and that kind of thing. Um Ultimately, Dream still does come and save her as a damsel in distress, with which isn't like the greatest of storytelling devices, but it it works, I think, for for what was being told here. Well, and it felt like she really connected with the idea of like because he had also been imprisoned. Yeah, she felt like he would understand. And he, I, I like I liked how he, you know he said like Yeah, I was in prison, but it wasn't as bad as you. Like you've had it far worse, and like, they were able to kind of connect over that and. So as much as that, yeah, sure, it is a little bit damsel and distressy. It's like I think it works better in this version. Like they connect over a shared trauma in a sense. Um, he he doesn't. He's not doing it in a way that feels like it's a transaction. 
Um, it, it, it just feels like it's something that he, you know, personally wants to do. And like, I don't know, we, we all like seeing a good vengeance, you know, story play out sometimes. Right. You know, we like to see uh, Sandman come in and be like, oh, I'm going to fuck this guy up. <laughs> right. Especially after the times that he's been sort of morally gray in terms of like we like our, our morality. We've seen him do things where we're like, oh, uh, I wouldn't have done that or I would have done that differently in this moment we're very clear about how he feels and it's kind of a hero moment for yeah for i mean and like i love that where this is positioned like we've seen enough in the show now of him to know the kinds of things he's capable of mm-hmm. and the power that he has and we also know that like he recently got even more power and like i don't know like something about him saying like you know oh i'll give him plenty of ideas like it's so yeah, ominous you're like awesome. oh he's about to get fucked up and I, I said it in the comic as well but it's a great way to show the power of a character without them just doing like crazy blasts or anything like that but to actually like influence and that power to like give someone too many ideas oh, man. and, and it's so it's a, it's like a poetic justice right in a way and and that's what it comes back to and the thing that I have always loved about the story even in the comic is the idea of this author so desperate for ideas he's willing to go to any lengths and then being cursed with so many ideas you know that he's like writing his fingers off on the walls um, yeah. which made it into the comic or made it into the, to the show. Not quite as bloody and gruesome as it was in the comic, but still pretty, pretty uh, affecting. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the idea then at the end, which I thought was really cool or towards the end where he says that he has no idea when he's trying to remember. And the idea of like, yeah, he's, he's been, he's been released, but also the curse that is having no ideas on him is cool. Like, I don't know. That is like, a, that is, that's a scary thing for authors. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think it's interesting that Calliope says, let him go. And then he's still worse off than before. Right. Like he's, it seems like he had some, he seems like he's like actually going to have a deficit of now, ideas yeah. now, like, like not like functioning. At, like, well, it, so one of the things I love about this whole idea is right. Like it, where ideas come from for writers is always this sort of romanticized notion and it goes all the way back to the idea of muses, right? Like the, it was divine inspiration. I think the word talent even has some sort of ties to like divine inspiration. And so when people think about talents, they think about God given ability that literally comes from God. And um, because of that, it's so externalized, but as an, like an author and someone who's trying to write and like, I know a lot of writers and like, it's not very helpful to think of it that way. And in fact, it can be very detrimental. And I think that's what the story is about, right? Like the idea that it doesn't come from within, it comes from somewhere else is itself kind of poisonous. And if you go out searching for a muse that you want to capture, it's always going to be, you know, like force, you're forcing the muse is, you know, what's, what's, what's what's described here versus the idea of actually like wooing the muse and like, nurturing your own inner muse if you want to think of it that way it's like a metaphor for your own creativity and like being gentle with it and letting it you know um, come to you in its own time that's going to be a better approach for creativity now you 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 complicate that as soon as you start equating it with sexuality but i think some of that does go back to the original myth that he's touching on so that's probably why it's here but anyway i i find all those metaphors interesting right it's stuff that i think about and stuff that i think a lot of creative people think about so just to get to the overall release of this, I I love that we're this is like a marketing thing potentially as well, right? Like this is smart. Bring people on the, back. Bring people back in. And uh, we're seeing that on, on display right now. Neil Gaiman has come out and said a few things recently that have got people kind of worried. And it's that even with the success, like the Sandman has been one of the top shows on Netflix for like the last two or three weeks now. And even with that success, uh, Gaiman's tweeted out and basically said, like, it's not a guarantee that we have a season two yet. We still need everyone to come back, watch the show, tell your friends to watch the show. If you haven't finished it, finish it. Yeah. Because that well, kind we've of stuff, been doing that. We've done our part. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm like, you know, it got me so emotional. I was like, maybe I just like put it on in the background while I'm working and stuff like just to like get the pump the numbers up. Yeah. Do, yeah. My, do my part. <laughs> So uh, I and I really do feel that way about the show. I want more of it. This 11th episode gave me a little a little hint of that when when I got that dopamine hit that I knew that another episode was out. I was like, holy shit, more Sandman. I'd love to see them not just come back and say we're going to do two or we're going to do two and three or two, two through four or yeah. something like that, too, because I think there's a real freedom and like you can see showrunners kind of relax a little bit and take their time a little more. And I think it it ends up being a better show 
when they're not feeling that pressure of like it has to be an instant success or it's going to get canned. Yeah. Um, and I would like to see them relax a little bit in future seasons and and develop long term storylines that they can feel like they're going to have time for. Yeah, I mean it's a. Uh... I, I feel good about the fact that we could get a season two with the way things are going. I, just, I hope so, I hope man. I hope that it comes of, that that comes of it. But at the same time, like it does worry me. Yeah. Like if we get a season two, what who would say we don't get a season three? You know, it, it's a it's a tough time right now for for a show like this, especially because Neil Gaiman's made it clear it's very expensive. And I just sent you I think I sent you another TikTok recently. I don't know if you've seen where Sturridge talks about how they made everything. He's like, it's practical. Like he's like hell pretty much all practical like everything they built so they're doing it the right way but that makes things expensive so i I just hope that netflix sees what they have in this because this is a huge property and could be like you know for years and years to come could be a huge like cultural touchstone yeah it's tough i know it's like sometimes it comes down to these numbers games and they're like oh we spent x amount of money on it and we only made x amount of money back in like new subscribers or something but like I, sometimes I wish that they'd have a little bit more of a long term view, you know, like if the thing continues to build popularity, you continue to get merchandise sales, long term subscribers who stay with Netflix. I don't know how they track that. Right. They often track new subscribers. But like what about the ones who end up staying and not canceling because they have something that they want to watch and they want to stick around for? I mean, like I've been low on Netflix recently. And if, it, you know, another drop in the bucket of Netflix doing the wrong thing and if they get rid of Sandman, like I'll threaten to cancel my subscription. Like I've never not had a Netflix subscription. What is, but... the, what is the line from the episode? Like a, the old woman pissing in the sea or something? Yeah. <laughs> Every little bit yeah. counts or helps or something. Exactly. Yeah, that's that'd be me. I'll be pissing in the sea trying to cancel my netflix subscription if they get rid of sandman i mean i i like it that much i I want more yeah so i personally think this is actually a better version of the calliope story than what we got in the comic i think this is the superior version so you know all props to him for being able to pull that off um i do want to talk about house of the dragon um but real quick in this episode there was a detail dropped that i don't think is a spoiler because it's in the show now so if you've seen this episode you know it um, they say that Morpheus's son that he had with Calliope, his name is Orpheus. He died in Thrace, I think it was, being torn apart and is now in hell or Hades. Hades, yeah. Uh, and um, that reminds me of, do you know this Orpheus character? And like, so the game Hades we just played, but I know both of us played, has this whole long thing with Eurydice which is uh, another uh, sort of myth thing. So I'm like, oh, okay, so is, is Orpheus going to be the son of Dream now? And does that mean we're going to see, do you think we're going to see an Orpheus character at some point in hell? Yeah. I, think I don't think are. there's any way we don't. Yeah, I, 100%. Especially because they know how this comic goes. So they have all of the, the you know, they have the whole story laid out before them. They can go pull on those things earlier, pull those strings up earlier. Um, and I, again... I am such a sucker for Greek mythology and like there's there's some problematic shit in all of mythology. For sure. For sure. I mean, it's... But the, these legends and myths exist and they're so interesting to think about in historical context and then just to, to view them as stories like these ancient myths. Uh, and, and the fact that Neil Gaiman is a huge, a huge fan and, and is a huge resource and then threads it into a lot of his storytelling. And he's written I mean, he's written entire books on just like mythology yeah north mythology so yeah absolutely man he's a, he's an expert in a lot of this stuff it really seems like um so let's talk about house of the dragon a little bit here at the end um if you haven't watched it yet we've only seen the first episode um i have read uh what is it fire and blood the name of the book that uh, the whole series is going to be based on you haven't you and i spoke off air and i know we didn't set this up at the beginning of the episode by the way so we're surprised we're talking about this kind of a follow-up to us talking about game of thrones on the main feed and then our season eight sort of reaction. Yeah. If you haven't listened to those episodes, uh, the short of it is we both uh, were huge fans of the show when it came out. I was a big book fan before the show ever came out. Mm-hmm. Um, I became a book fan. You became a book fan. Yeah. And then both of us didn't like the way it ended. So right. that now you're basically caught up. <laughs> but we also, we also, I think we're both uh, invested enough in the world from George R. R. Martin's words from his actual books that we, we would, we're willing to see more from, from this world. If it didn't mean that Dan and Dave were involved. Dan and Dave aren't our yeah. ones doing it. Sapochnik instead is, uh, I think, one of Love the showrunners. Miguel Sapochnik, And too, he yeah. has some of the best episodes uh, of all time for Game of Thrones. So the idea of him running and, you know, being one of the showrunners is really exciting to me. Yeah. So we talked off air and, and something that I didn't realize is Fire and Blood, he's now set it, is going to come out in two volumes and the second volume's not out yet. Okay. So there is going to be a second volume. So I think yeah. there, yeah, I mean, I... 
this won't mean a lot to you, but I think there's something called uh, the dance, the, the dance of dragons, and then yeah. the uh, Blackfire Rebellion are two mm -hmm. major components that happen. I mean, I've heard of those things for in sure. In <laughs> Fire and Blood, they're referenced at, at different times in Game of Thrones as histories, um, and I think we're gonna get dance essentially is going to be this season and that, that makes me think that uh the rebellion's going to be they can set season. themselves up i also so like aegon's conquest and there's so much other stuff that they can dig into that that george has written about i guess they can do that in flashback too in the show if they wanted well and, well there's also other apparently other shows that are in the works so if this does well we might see other okay other so that brings up another thing i heard george r. r martin you know recently talking about how he wanted 10 seasons 12 13 seasons he was asking for at least 10 and they were against it, and obviously that was part of it. A lot it. of stuff has come out that kind of illustrates how things went wrong. And, like, sure, it all comes back to the fact that he didn't finish the books, but it also seems like Dan and Dave did not want to give it the time it needed. They were ready to move on, and uh, Martin was not happy about that and basically was not in touch with them anymore yeah. for a while at the end. There was another show other than House of the Dragon that got pretty far into development with HBO, though, that was a White Walker spinoff that wasn't based in source material and george R. R. martin was not interested in pursuing that like he he was kind of against it from what i understand and oh, it kind of fell through that I was gonna say that but that didn't go anywhere yeah it's fallen through to this point here's the thing i'll say about the fire and blood i am excited for the idea of a show where you got sapochnik on there who's shown that he knows how to make good tv and then you um have a story that has been written with a beginning a middle and an end from martin he wrote it in a way like if you ever read the book, it's very like it's, it's written in this historical perspective from like a historian at the old town. And it's kind of dry in a way because it, it reads like you're reading a history. Yet there's all these really cool details that get dropped in there. So if you if you're interested in the details, you're like, oh, shit, this is cool. And then there are moments of narration that work really well, too. So they have a lot of room to adapt. But also the bones and the outline is very Martin. And it's a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not a beginning, a middle, and then a question mark. So I, I I think this show will feel like one coherent story in a way that the main show did not, because by the end, it was being written by two guys who didn't give a shit about it. So uh, to me, that gives it more potential. For sure. And and so having the source material there and have it, we've already seen the first episode. Like, what was your reaction to the first episode? I liked it. You know, I think... um. It there's a couple things about it. Like, I think it wanted to say that, like, we're still one of the most shocking shows on television. So they had some pretty horrific violence. Um, they had a very graphic uh, scene with this uh, breach birth um, being depicted. Um, it was emotionally moving and heartbreaking, kind of ripped your heart out when um, it was revealed that the baby only lasted a day. Um so all of that is very feels very Game of Thrones to me, and it also continues to say, like, to me, this felt like a shot across the bow to Amazon a little bit of, like, yeah, you can go watch that Rings of Power show, but um, we want to remind you that we're different, and this is what makes Game of Thrones different, because you're going to watch that show, and it's not going to feel like this. I can guarantee you that. So I'm hearing good things, by the way, about that so far I, I somebody said I, I saw something online about, about rings, rings of, of power, power but but we'll see man yeah we'll see i'm interested in both like don't get me wrong but i think it's trying to say we're different i, I think game of thrones has always had an allure as the like is this like oh like hushed hushed voice voices you know like did you watch that show like did you, you see know? that birthing scene yeah or? Or, yeah it was just it's it's so intense and wild and it's so violent and like I, it's the kind of stuff, you know, it's on HBO, it's late at night, it's it's for adults very clearly. Um, I, it, I've always liked that about Game of Thrones. Like I know a lot of people turn their nose up about it, but like I think that's cool and it's always appealed to me. And um, I think that works in all those ways. Now, well, I will say like right now the story feels fairly straightforward. We see a bad dude <laughs> um, in, uh, 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 what's his name, Prince uh, Aegon? Damon. Ga Damon, Prince Damon. Yeah. Seems like a bad dude. And then we see uh, uh, the princess who is now next in line. She seems good. So we have Rhaenyra, like a pretty yeah. straightforward good versus evil setup. But I think uh, there's room for that to grow and become more complex in the way that we're used to, where you'll start getting multiple factions being involved and more gray areas. Whereas right now, he seems kind of like a proto Joffrey type. <laughs> and uh, kind of, I, I thought he was more like a Jamie type. He's well, he's like a blend between the two, yeah. which is scary, right? Like he's yeah. kind of Jamie, kind of Joffrey. 
uh, you know, definitely a shithead, but also he's got that Targaryen. He runs through a little bit of Viserys, uh, you know, the brother from early on, season one. Danny's brother, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, he's interesting and definitely seems like he's going to be a big problem going forward. Um, I, I know a little bit, but honestly, I also have forgot a lot of what happens. So, so you know, in my defense, I don't remember exactly how it plays out. And even if, um, you know, the story's already there. So the mystery for it'll be like book readers already knowing back in Game of Thrones days how it ends and everything. So book readers already know what's going on. And I don't think that takes away from anything like the mystery will be, you know, somewhat still there for show watchers. Well, and how it's going to be depicted is going to be very exactly. different because the it, that book is not written in the same way that the core Dr- Game yeah. of Thrones books are where there's like actual narration. From what I understand, you also have opportunity to explore the other houses and factions in ways that that sort of historical like look back doesn't doesn't get into. I thought it so. was cool, man, seeing the big, huge version of the Iron Throne with all yeah. the swords and, you know, the king's cutting himself on it, which is a detail right from uh, yep. uh, the, the histories. Um, very cool, right? Like seeing how the, the realm was different back then. And, you know, you see the, the gold cloaks, you know, basically getting out there and chopping off hands and, you know, dicks and whatever yeah. else and pretty graphic <laughs> stuff. And, and then you got like, a, like, I'm always a sucker for a cool jousting sequence. And like, we got some pretty yeah. epic ones with that, with this surprise Dornishman who was a mystery knight and mm-hmm. actually like held his own against Damon and bested him in the end. Like, if I could just say one thing that I that I wish they didn't do, it was that the very beginning shot. They shouldn't have said anything about Danny. They should have just said this is 150 or 170 years before. I bet there was a lot of discussion about that, whether or not to, to mention it. Yeah, they shouldn't have. They could have said immediately put a sour taste in my mouth because it just reminded me of how unhappy I was with how the story played out with Danny. <laughs> I, I think they're they're They have this like rose tinted look view back of what they did with Danny. And I'm like, you guys didn't do it justice. I think it's more that they feel married to it. So they have to, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think like they're not going to remake the final season. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not going to happen. So they're married to it. Now that is, that is their canon that they're going to have to live with and for better or for worse. So I think that's them trying to do it. One of the things that stands out to me that's good is, I felt immediately like these are some Game of Thrones characters. Like the characters stood out to me. They this feels like Martin again, right? And we haven't felt Martin in a while in Game of Thrones. To me, it's he's been absent. All of a sudden, we're back in his world. I don't know. And like you know, some people don't like it, but like I've been a fan of his, and I, I like I've liked Game of Thrones. And like again, it it feels like him again, and it feels like we're in his world. And I know that this whole story, having read it, feels that way throughout. And so I think that this show will will succeed on that merit is my prediction. Like, I think the show's going to do well, um, you know, and I think it will bring some people back. Will it, will it forgive the wrongs? No. And like, and does that make me feel better about season eight? Not at all. Season eight was a disaster. Season seven was kind of a disaster too, especially in retrospect. So, I mean, when things start changing, like we can say seasons one through four, we were, we were really happy with and things start to change. And there's great scenes in some of those seasons later. Oh, sure. But- Battle of the Bastards, you know, happens later. Think of Sapochnik. Sh- Sp- 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 yeah. And like that hasn't happened in the books yet. So like there were moments where we had reasons to hope, but it just, you know, it just didn't work out. I'll, I'll end by basically just saying that I, I'm not going to let something that eventually happens in the story affect this self-contained story and my enjoyment but of it. View it as a self-contained story. It's going to have its own arc, and I think it's going to be enjoyable in its own right, you know, and, and it's going to be shocking and dark and brutal, but have moments of fuck yeah cheers, you know, like, like Game of Thrones does when it's at its best, and I think we're going to get that. And the show, to me, looks great. I mean, the costuming costuming's amazing. It's it's got that like it's just got that feel that like uh, the show has, where it's like they are putting the effort in to make it look fantastic, to to get everything right. And I I hope that the, uh, uh, speaking of Lord of the Lord of the Rings, I hope that it feels the same way, right? Like I hope when I'm watching that show, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a show where they put in the effort because you get that in those original films too. Anyway, once again, we're getting too big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a feather in the cap of HBO right now as this as we're ending this conversation is just the first episode of House of the Dragon was the highest viewership of any HBO premiere ever. Yeah, I saw that. So that's encouraging. That's good on them. And I think people are interested. I bet there was a big sigh of relief when that happened because there's a lot of worry about it. At the end of season eight of Game of Thrones, I thought that people forgot about Game of Thrones. Yeah. And, and uh, it seems like there's yeah. still a thirst for it. So. Let me also just say I'm so glad that all 10 episodes didn't drop and that this is going to be an ongoing yeah. conversation. I just personally, I, I. It's a big part of Game of Thrones. I occasionally yeah. like uh, binging, but sometimes I think uh, it's just better to prolong, prolong uh, satisfaction, I guess. I don't know. 
<laughs> I agree, especially in the, in the case of a show like this, like yeah. event television. Exactly. All right, well, we better wrap this thing. Until next time. Keep adapting. <laughs>